Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, including Reed Fishler, Larry Bailey, Michelle Sergiu, and William Serbeck II. On this episode of DTNS, ARM cancels Qualcomm's license to use its designs in a game of Chipkin. Get it? Mm-hmm. Air taxis take another step toward reality. And Scott Johnson weighs in on why Netflix shut down its AAA game studio. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, October 23rd, 2024 in 20 Los Angeles. I'm 20 Merritt. (laughs) Okay, Tom. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. Here in Salt Lake City, I'm still Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. I'm just going to keep saying 20, 20, 20. You're just excited to go on vacation tomorrow, Dom. It's possible. It's possible yeah. that I'm it's, both it's, frightened you know, and excited. Nothing, nothing yeah, wrong with that. Just, just get, you know, vacation punchy. I, I, I haven't get started it. packing yet. Oh, geez. Well, then you've got work to do after all this. Yeah, I do. I can't find my USB-C to XLR adapter either. I might have to run to Best Buy and just buy an Elgato. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. Right. I mean, sometimes I go to Guitar Center just to do something like that, where I'm like, yeah. let's, just, let's just go. Yeah. And kind of I could go to stuff. Guitar Center, actually. That's a good yeah. point. Yeah. Well, no, that's Guitar Center is great for these sort of yeah. things. All right. Meanwhile, while I ponder that, let's start with the quick hits. Adobe has made its Fresco drawing app available for free for all its users. This puts it squarely up against Procreate and Clip Studio Paint. Fresco supports touch and stylus support for iPad, iOS, and Windows. It was previously free, but it had some features locked behind a subscription. So starting now, Fresco goes from $10 a month to free for all of those features, technically making it cheaper than Procreate's $12.99 one-time purchase price. The information's supply chain sources say Apple has scaled down production of the Apple Vision Pro in the past few months. Supposedly, the company that does the final assembly of the Vision Pro has been told to prepare for a possible wind down in November. This could mean a new version of the headset is coming. It could also mean that they're not selling enough. Uh, It's possible the ramp down doesn't occur if sales pick back up or if the new version ends up using some of the same chips. Google announced a new tool to watermark AI generated text, expanding on its synth ID technology for images. The system embeds supposedly undetectable watermarks into all sorts of AI content. The move is part of Google's effort to enhance transparency, and it isn't alone. Meta, TikTok, or a couple other companies working on similar watermarking solutions to label AI-produced content as well. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman reports that Apple's making progress on its upcoming M4 MacBook Air and says it could possibly arrive in early 2025. Apple's also reportedly planning to refresh its entry-level iPad at that point. And uh, don't forget, Gurman also says the new M4 MacBook Pro, iMac, and Sarah, M4 Mac Mini, supposed to launch next week. Any day, please. I'm begging you, Apple. I'm begging you at this point. On my knees, begging you. Need my knees. My I, knees. Just, just do it. NVIDIA says it also re- resolved a design flaw in its Blackwell AI chips that were causing production delays. CEO Jensen Huang confirmed that the issue has been fixed, letting the company's B200 GPUs ship by the end of this year. These GPUs are designed for large-scale AI applications and are expected to have better performance and energy efficiency overall. ARM has canceled Qualcomm's chip architecture license. This is both a big deal and likely not to have any effect. Uh, So we can explain why. The architecture license is used to design the chip. Qualcomm could still use the instruction set. So it wouldn't have to stop making ARM compatible chips. It would just have to stop using ARM's own designs. That's kind of a distinction without a difference for its majority of its line because most of Qualcomm's chips use both. So unless something changes, Qualcomm has 60 days to stop using that license, meaning it would probably have to stop selling its chips to anyone. However, there's there's a little little twist in here. Uh, Qualcomm just announced the Snapdragon 8 Elite. We mentioned that earlier this year, this week. It does not use the ARM architecture design. So Qualcomm very clearly was trying to get away from having to pay this license fee. Uh, ARM 
wants Qualcomm to pay more for this license fee because Qualcomm bought a company called Nuvia. Uh, they use a lot of what Nuvia did in the laptop and PC chips that Qualcomm makes. So the Copilot Plus PCs, for example. Uh, Qualcomm tried to say Nuvia had a license for the design, so we're going to use that license to make all of these Nuvia designed chips. And Arm said, no, no, Nuvia had a license for that design for their level of chip making. Qualcomm makes a bigger deal out of chips. We need more money from you if you want to keep using Nuvia's license. And so they're going to court over that on December 16th. This move of suspending Qualcomm's architecture design license entirely is a move to put pressure on Qualcomm to settle over this before December 16th. So if you if you want my opinion, this is probably all going to resolve likely before December 16th, certainly before the end of December when the 60 days is up, uh, and Qualcomm won't lose its license. They'll, they'll just agree to pay a little more. Uh, they'll pay a little more than they were paying ARM, but it'll be less than ARM was asking. They'll, they'll agree on a number. They'll slide pieces of paper back and forth across the conference table or something <laughs> like that. That's, that's how I think it works. Oh, I love that idea. Um, how much do you think this is about the fact that... Uh, that ARM as an architecture, as a chip structure, as you know, as the new hot thing on stage, pushing x86 aside a little bit in desktop, mobile applications, and everything else, it's having a moment. Is that is that a factor here? Is that what's causing this sort of price hike and and fighting and all that? Maybe, yeah, maybe. Um, it certainly makes the pot bigger. And when there's more money to fight over, especially when the money just starts to grow like it is now for ARM. Uh, there, there can be more fights over the new way of d divvying things up. Uh, you often see it happen at the other end too. Like we've been seeing more fights with cable operators over distribution as the pot diminishes. So mm. uh, on either end of that bell curve, you get the fight. That could be part of it. I think the other thing is that ARM realizes that Apple and NVIDIA uh, and other people have been making a chips with their own architecture. They may be ARM compatible, but they're not using ARM's architecture designs, uh, and they're worried about losing that revenue source, and they're they're trying to preserve that re revenue source. But I mean, mm. wouldn't Qualcomm be like, "Well, uh, we're not getting along. Let's not use your architecture anymore, your design they, architecture." But they already have chips that use the architecture, right? So if they if they don't, so this get, applies keep to this existing chips, not just future chips existing chips that they're still making right with that design like yeah yeah they have one chip they've announced that doesn't use the design uh and arm knows that so if they had to stop using the design by the end of december the majority of their revenue would go would have to go away or more likely they'd have to scramble and redesign all of those chips that they're currently selling that do use the ARM architecture, not to use the ARM architecture, that would cause a world of problems. Nobody wants that within Qualcomm. Uh, and ARM knows it. So ARM, ARM, up till now, Qualcomm has said, see you in court. You know, we, we license out our technology to other people all the time. We, we see Apple in court uh, every year. We're like old friends, uh, you know, not a problem. And I think ARM was like, we're going to tighten the screws and, and make you want to settle this faster. Mm, yeah. yeah, it just feels like a... a battle that brewed quickly do you know, you know what i mean like i, I might could be wrong, totally wrong on how the timeline went but it just seems like it's just lately it, every other story even on this show is like oh something's happening with arms something's happening yeah, with yeah. Qualcomm. something's happening here and there and it feels almost not quite ai levels of like whoa watch out the train's moving <laughs> yeah but it's enough to it's enough to notice and it's enough to i guess ask the question i mean a lot really. of it is also ai you know that's, that's true. A lot of it's driving the need AI for thing. more chips. Yeah, no, absolutely. Good um, point. Yeah. yeah, I think ARM's licensing arrangements were appropriate to a market full of people making them for phones. Uh, and the licensing arrangements are being strained and ARM's business model be is being strained because now it's being made for servers and laptops and PCs and more kinds of phones uh, and more powerful phones that have NPUs. And and so, it yeah, I think ARM is, has also been a kind of a football being tossed around between SoftBank and then going public and then not going public and, and all of that. So I think that puts a strain on it, too. Yeah. 
Well, it'll be interesting. Like, there's also the other factor here is everybody always wants to throw uh, talking points around about mobile, um, but it's also a lot of other kinds of devices this time around. We're not just talking about yeah, desktop yeah, and then no, mobile exactly. and then right. the next w single category. It's like well, yeah, all like, over um, the place. A mobile you know? chip, you know, not that long ago was like, oh, it's simple. You know, it's not a desktop. You know, it's not a gaming PC. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, just for mobile. And now mobile devices are... <laughs> Are supposed to run our lives. Yeah. This They're is going to push more more people to to Risk Five. I'm not saying this is going to make Risk Five more popular than ARM, but it certainly causes people to look at this and go, "Man, dealing with ARM can be can be touchy." You know, if we go to an open standard like Risk Five, maybe that's better. You know, mm -hmm. Risk Five has its own uh, issues with with capabilities and stuff, but it's it's looking more and more attractive. And now I I definitely understand why Qualcomm has been toying around with Risk Five uh, and and promoting it as an open standard because yeah. it, it's a better alternative than going to court all the time. Mm -hmm. Unless you're a Qualcomm's lawyer, then it's great. Then it's great. You guys are having yeah. a heyday. Jeez. Well, if you're a Qualcomm lawyer, you're probably no stranger to being in helicopters. I'm just gonna. I, <laughs> That's probably. I'm just gonna guess. Could be true. Yeah. yeah. Transition. Um, <laughs> thank you, Scott. I appreciate that. <laughs> the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, issued new rules on Tuesday that recognize vertical takeoff and landing, or VTOL, VTOL, air taxis as a new type of aircraft. Very new type of aircraft. Not a plane. Not a helicopter. Something else. And issued. Final rules for operating them and how pilots should be trained to fly them. The new category is called power lifted aircraft. Delta has been working with Joby and United with Archer to develop the air taxis and integrate them into their systems to bring passengers to airports. They're not the only companies trying this out, um, but uh, yeah, we we we've got we've got some momentum here. And as somebody who lives in Los Angeles and works from home and doesn't have to do a lot of commuting, so I'm not going to complain too much about traffic. I say, take us to the sky. Yeah. yeah. No, the idea with these these airline partnerships is uh, you would be able to check in uh, at, at a local air taxi depot, uh, get your bags. They would just air taxi you all the way into the airport, just just like making a connecting flight. Yeah. Uh, and and you would just skip right over all of the traffic. You would skip right over, uh, you know, a bunch of other waiting in line. You probably still, you still might have to do some security screening there. I'm not sure how they'll implement it. I don't think they know how they're going to implement it. But it's a big deal for these airlines to be able to speed people in and say, oh, I'm going to fly United. I'm going to fly Delta because I can do that and not sit in traffic for 90 minutes. Uh, yeah. So this, this approval, this is the first new category the FAA has announced in 80 some years. The helicopter Jeez. was the last one. Uh, this is this is a big step forward to saying we are going to we're going to lay the groundwork for regulatory approval of, of these sorts of vehicles. And I don't know. I I mean, I don't I don't know too. I I do not have a pilot's license of any kind. But for anybody who's sort of like, <laughs> did is, anyone assume you did? You did. <laughs> what if I did? I, uh, I would love that. I would. Then that I would, would be worth telling you. people about. Yeah, sure. I would fly yeah, with yeah, you I'm for a pilot. sure. Like all night. Yeah. I just want to go. Night. No, but yeah. for anybody who's saying like, well, isn't that what a helicopter would do? It's similar to that. But uh, these new, you know, the new uh, jurisdiction flies like a fixed wing plane, mm -hmm. not like a helicopter. So it is, it is a different thing. Meaning, you know, if there's a helipad or whatever, it's, you know, it's, it's all going to be uh, classified differently. Is it yeah. vertical takeoff and landing and stuff still? Like yeah. it's like yeah, it takes okay. off and lands like a helicopter, but flies like a fixed wing plane. Oh, okay, so more drone like, I suppose. Yeah, a little bit. Design. Yeah, they're it, like big giant drones in some it, ways. It, it mm -hmm. really is a big giant drone. Yeah, yeah. I like that a lot. <laughs> you know, I'm like, let me in there. Let's. It's do a it. whole. It's a whole other category of. I guess you're in danger driving the car to the airport, right? So it's not that different. I mean, probably less, even less. Oh, unsafe you mean like, than, like oh, for anybody wise, who's, who's yeah. thinking that this this seems dangerous? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're in danger at all times. Because people you're, are going to ask that question. I'm, 
I haven't looked it up. I'm going to guess you will be safer. I mean, yeah. I guess we can't really say until we know the safety record and pilots get certified and they start flying. But I'm going to guess these end up being safer than driving in a car. Probably, sure. right? Like I, I, in the same way that planes did. But there's still that like human <laughs> that yeah. human reaction, which is like, oh crap, I'm in the air. I can't control any of this. If someone uh, else is controlling it, not me. Yeah. I'm could I'm driving my own car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's well, interesting though. And as I think as this technology advances is we start getting into like the Waymos of the sky where it's like, well, I mean, the company is just doing it. There's mm -hmm. no like person who's, you know, being weird at the wheel and yeah. putting me in danger the way that, you know, I might feel in a car on the freeway. Mm -hmm. There, it, it is. You does still get have to confusing. trust the company, of course, but it, sure. yeah. it does get confusing because there's a lot of autonomous VTOL efforts, some of them from these same companies, uh, but and but they're not always trying to push to that yet although i know there's some plans to launch that sort of thing in dubai and and elsewhere so uh i i do think this is the first time i've looked at one of these stories and said oh that's the kind of regulatory approval you need from the government to make this actually happen on a time frame versus like we're ju we're just 5 to 10 years away now it's like oh we're now we're now the clock starts ticking now now you yeah. can start to say it it just needs commercial viability it, you can it needs actually to hit get, your goals now yeah, yeah it needs actual places to take off and what are the air routes that it can take and and all of that uh which is still a lot Right. But it's less of a like, will they even get approved to do this? This this makes it look like, yeah, they probably could. Yeah. It's crazy to think my mom was six years old when the FAA did their last thing. Eight, oh, yeah, eighty-six. Right? That's crazy uh -huh. to think about. Right. My like, mom that is wasn't a long even time alive. Ago. Right. Like pre-mom for you. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so barely. You, you... <laughs> Sorry, mom, to blow up your spot. But yeah. Yeah. yeah like, no, yeah. Like... I just I don't know what else they would have. I, I guess I don't know what else they would have approved as a new category in the meantime. So it's not like I'm saying, oh, the FEA should drag in a feet on new technology. That's not what I <laughs> right. mean. But right. it is wild sometimes to think as quickly as as technology and society moves forward, sometimes you don't need a lot of other stuff between you know big major changes like this this is a this is a big one a big deal 80 years i'm with kt data on this though we need one of these to look like a jetson's car yeah and maybe even have the noise the <laughs> yeah 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 i'd like that well, you have I mean, to hear that song every I time mean, think, oh, of, no. think about how much people care about what their cars look like <laughs> right yeah. Like right, one, yeah. one, once we go, you know, up to the sky, it's like you still want ooh the Lambo. Yeah, when I own it or it's it's you. autonomous and I and it's my autonomous freaking Airbus thing. Yeah, then you're gonna have all the you're gonna want to do colors. You're gonna want to do all yeah, those things. Yeah, yeah. I'm, like I'm I, for this I, I flew the cool air taxi today. I just uh, want it to take me to LAX. <laughs> Faster I know. Than Uber. Same. I don't yeah. care what I'm color like, it is. I'm like, for now. The, for now. you know, yeah, you know, you know, my old Honda Civic from 1984, all good. Just make I wanted it to fly. change its mind. I wanted to start to go to LAX <laughs> and then go to Santa Ana and Stegs. That's a better airport. Uh, yeah, or you just end up at Van Nuys and you're like, but I'm not flying private. Yeah, you're like, me. <laughs> oh no, I'm so um, far from home. Yeah. Just, just one telling detail before we move off of this story. Uh, we realized that we needed to schedule the car to come pick us up to take us to the airport tomorrow at 4.45 a.m. And our reaction was, oh, good, the traffic will be light. <laughs> not, oh, that's horrible time of the morning. Not, oh, it's going to be hard to get up. It was yeah. like, oh, good, it'll be a fast ride. Yeah. You'll, you'll get there quick. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that's L.A. for you. But, oof, mm. yeah, that, that's, a, that's an early day. Indeed. Uh, well, if you're having an early, late, or otherwise day, uh, you can always find someone to chat about with at our Discord. Uh, go check our Discord out by linking a Patreon account. Become a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. On Tuesday, we mentioned that former Overwatch boss Chaco Sani, former Halo executive Joseph Staten, and former God of War art director Raphael Grizzotti have all left Netflix's AAA game studio. So, Scott, you're here with us now. What do you think this means for Netflix's game strategy going forward? Well, they left because they folded it. And the big question is, why did Netflix decide to fold their, their first and only and barely two-year-old uh, AAA game studio. 
I guess maybe at first we should say what that means. AAA typically means big, expensive, large project type games. Stuff with a lot of 3D graphics, a lot of realism, typically large teams, 100 people on a team, that sort of thing. Um, that was a big deal when they announced it, and it was a small announcement. They didn't make a huge deal about it, other than these are top-notch talent we're pulling from these other companies, um, and they're going to come here and make something really special. That's kind of where it ended. They had no projects to announce at the time of the forming of the studio or anything like that. So we were all sort of just left with, we know who these people are, so we kind of have an idea of the kinds of games they might make, but we really didn't know. Jump ahead a couple of years, the whole thing gets dissolved. Those guys are off to do other things. And to me, this is, I mean, I'm also, I, I kind of have a couple of theories here. First, I think it's consistent with what Netflix has done prior to this with their game strategy, including mobile, including what they do with Netflix, the app and Netflix on TV. Um, but I also think this has a lot to do, and they haven't said, but I think it has a lot to do with timing. The industry is in a dip at the moment and not profitability wise, but they're preparing for quarters where the profitability is going to be harder to show on paper. And... Uh, it seems like, and I kind of agree with them, this is a really weird time to ride that storm out. If, if, you've, if you don't have a ton invested already, meaning you haven't already made three-fourths of a, of a massive release, then I think this is a kind of let's cut our losses now and let's see where this thing goes and then we'll rethink what our strategy is and maybe we don't need to make a triple a game based on bridgerton we use this <laughs> use this earlier as a bad example but uh stranger things or whatever ip because i do think that was their main strategy in all of this i think netflix goal was to say let's take our popular ips and then we're going to turn those into other media whatever they may be and in this case games let's make a big triple a just for fun's sake, let's say it's an MMO version of the Stranger Things universe, which actually sounds kind of kind of interesting. But you're talking about possibly hundreds of millions of dollars to invest in such a thing. And I think that they probably have very smart analysts who went, we're coming to the tail end of that series. The popularity is also coming to its, to its end. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like people are chomping at the bit for this. And the industry's in a slump. So why would we do this? And I think that they have the pockets to do to to make this decision, and it fits with what they've done already. Tom and I have talked about this countless times on here and, and TMS segments and everywhere else. Netflix doesn't care if we all have expectations of what game announcements are. What they care about is test it here. Try a little of this. Let's do a bit of this. Everyone will make fun of our mobile strategy. We don't care. We're just we're trying it. We're trying to get some data. We're trying to get some information. What happens? We're making small investments. And I think that that is actually the smart thing to do right now, given the current climate. Um, I, I think that the purchasing or, or, sorry, forming of that studio was maybe a little bit premature, but it was also a decision made at the height of when things were popping off just mm -hmm. post pandemic. So I'm also not surprised that they tried it. Um, will, we, will we see something come out of this ever? I, I do think so, but I think it will be smaller projects and more focused projects. So instead of saying we're going to make a giant action adventure out of the, that, you know, that television universe of some show or something, they might make a point and click adventure set in the Stranger Things universe. So they might do something with Bridgerton that's, I don't know what they do with that. I keep bringing that dumb one up, but whatever first it may be. First person shooter. Sure. Yeah. A first person shooter set in the Bridgerton. Tom, don't tempt me with a good time. That's a great idea. Um, but uh, all of that being said, um, there's no promise of a cash in here. And the games industry is in some weird flux right now. So yeah. I actually think they're smart to cut tail when they did. And they're not cutting their mobile studios. No. They, they kept those. So they must think that that's worth spending the money on. Uh, I'm with you. I, I think Netflix's game strategy has been we're going to slowly build up these games until they start to catch people's eye and we get more and more people enjoying them. And once we reach a certain number of people enjoying these games, then we can split it off as an extra tier uh, or even a separate service, depending. Uh, they, they want to make more money off these games. They also want to use the games as a way to retain people who might otherwise cancel a Netflix subscription. They're not there now. But they're getting there. They are getting more and more games, and there's more and more things that people look at and go, oh, okay, yeah, this is a fun little game. I'm going to play it. I think they got ahead of their skis with the AAA game studio. Netflix does have a studio for television and movies, 
but it doesn't always use it for all of its original television and movies. Uh, and I think that's what they realized is we don't need a AAA studio yet. We can still have other studios make games for us. They can make the Bridgerton first person shooter for us. We don't need to have a game studio to make that happen. Yeah. And in the case of Amazon, great, great that you brought them up. They're still operating that division at a bit of a loss. Um, it, the, the studio canceled some pretty high profile projects and have published a couple. And they're also publishing some third party stuff from Asia. Uh, Lost Ark, a Korean made sort of Diablo-like MMO, did really well for them. And that's a Amazon Games published game, at least here in the States and I think Europe. Um, and they also publish, they just published something called Liber Throne and Liberty, another big MMO. Again, Korean developers. They seem to be pretty in, 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 uh, in deep over there. And then uh, they just essentially relaunched a, a patch that I would call a relaunch studio game that they built. They built an MMO called... Um, I just forgot the name, New World. And this New World Avernum patch is basically a relaunch of that game. It had a very str a hard struggle at the beginning. It has done better over time. It's now on consoles with this launch, as well as this new PC patch, which is taking it to new heights. They seem to be all in. They seem to be like, well, we're operating at a loss, but we're also Amazon, and we can do this little experiment. They do it with Twitch. They lose money on a lot of things. Um, so I think they're going to stick with it. And I think that gives a little bit of a burr over there at Netflix to say, don't give up on this entirely. These things ebb and flow, you know, where the money is isn't always where it is yesterday. It might be somewhere else tomorrow. So I, I, I hope they all kind of stick with it because competition never hurts and the gaming landscape needs new faces. So, you know, we'll see what they do. Yeah. I don't think it means the end of Netflix gaming by no. any stretch, though. No. It's, it's just a, a, a change of direction. Yep. All right. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes from Toby referencing the segment on Tuesday's show about celebrity face recognition. Toby says, I don't feel like this is just about the celebrity. I think it's a win for the consumer who may be duped by the fake ads using the celebrity face to fa falsely claim endorsement of their scams and their schemes. If the result is that there are fewer fake ads, this is a good step. Toby says, hopefully now there's less chance that my great aunt will click through a fake ad lose money or get threatening contact from a pressured indentured sales team in some far flung call center, for example. No, that's a great point. It's not just about protecting the celebrities, uh, likenesses. It's, it's about protecting people from being scammed as well. Um, that also doesn't mean that Meta isn't going to use this facial recognition data for some other reason, but they're saying they're not. Uh, and this is a good thing to prevent. Uh, I don't want your great aunt or your great uncle to get uh, threatened by indentured sales no. teams. Second cousins, yeah. once removed, yeah. none of them. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Uh, Scott Johnson, we might be second cousins once we're moved. Who knows? Sure. I don't know. Um, Maybe. But, uh, but when we're not here doing the show, what are you up to? Well, the Lanes and the Johnsons, they go way back. But I'll tell you what does also go way back, and that is my show uh, that is entirely about the video game industry and issues like this Netflix thing, uh, along with all the fun stuff, like what did we play and what's cool this week and what's coming out next month and that kind of stuff. If that sounds interesting to you, check out our roundtable show called Core. It airs on Thursdays and goes up wherever you get your podcasts right after that. More details can be found at frogpants.com slash core. Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. T-Mobile raised prices for people who had a lifetime price lock, but they were still alive. <gasps> we're going to discuss this. Whoa. Ooh. Well, just a reminder, you can catch our show, which we do live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC is when it all goes down. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow, discussing if generative AI will change the way we contact and interact with our political representatives. <laughs> The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>